immortality or eternal life is the concept of existing for a potentially infinite or indeterminate length of time. Throughout history, many humans have had the desire to live forever. What form an unending or indefinitely long human life would take, or whether it is even possible, has been the subject of much speculation, fantasy, and debate. We begin the article with definitions of immortality. See also concepts of immortality below in the article. A common concept of immortality is a continued spiritual existence after bodily death. Many people today believe in this type of immortality, a philosophy of dualism or a belief in the immortal soul, as it is a dogma of almost every sect in Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism. The Hebrew patriarchs and their like-minded descendants believe that their life or existence was originally a gift of their God, that this gift is permanent and irre irrevocable, and that humans will never really die in the sense of non-existence. Others believe that they can achieve immortality through their legacy, through their acts and the achievements that they leave behind, a common belief sometimes called renown or glory. Such was the belief of Alexander the Great. This view of immortality is different from others in that it places value not on the continuing of one's physical, spiritual, or intellectual self, but rather on how one will be remembered by generations to come. Quote, their heroic works live on in the world for us to remember them by and others can emulate." Close quote. Or even how the world is influenced by one's acts even if oneself is not remembered. This view of immortality is embraced in many Germanic and humanistic philosophies. Another view of immortality concentrates on leaving offspring or immortality via evolution, which is curiously similar to Richard Dawkins' theory of the selfish gene. A quote, you never really quite die as long as there is some of your genetic material left behind in this world. However, there has always been a different breed of immortalist, one who believes it may be possible to avoid bodily death altogether. These people believe in the possibility of immortality in a physical sense, rather than, or in addition to, immortality in a spiritual sense. Many European and Chinese alchemists were among such people. Gunpowder was said to have been invented by Chinese alchemists in pursuit of immortality. The depiction in literature of Gilgamesh, which was one such example of this, and an entire cycle or cycles of Arthurian legend exists in the British Isles, including the Knights of the Round Table going in search for the Holy Grail, supposedly the chalice from which Jesus and his disciples drank from at the Last Supper. In more recent titles, people have had their dead bodies frozen and kept at low temperatures in the hopes that advances in medical science and technology will allow them to be unfrozen, cured, and restored to health at some point in the future. Mainstream science is still divided if it is possible to eventually stop physical aging and thus achieve this immortality. There is also another perspective, diffuse immortality, wherein even though your mind ceases with death, your physical body goes on to be recycled throughout the rest of time. For example, your body breaks down into its component elements, is absorbed into the soil, then into plants, then animals, and so on and so on. While this perspective is not quite as well known as the others, a small percentage of people polled do tend to agree with this statement. Well, you, as it were, cease to exist in a personal sense. In another sense, your body will be recycled until the breakdown of all matter through proton decay at the end of the universe. In the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, the wave function never collapses, and thus all possible outcomes of a quantum event exist simultaneously, with each event apparently spawning an entirely new universe in which a single possible outcome exists. In this physical theory, one could hypothetically live forever as there might exist a string of 
possible quantum outcomes in which one never dies. This theory of quantum immortality, however, is not widely regarded by the scientific community as being a verifiable or even necessarily correct offshoot of the many worlds interpretation, which itself exists as one possible interpretation of quantum mechanics among many. There is also the possibility of a brain scan of such precision that the results could be stored in some form of mass media and then one could live in an artificially intelligent state indefinitely. Moving now to a section of types of immortality. Immortality can be divided into two main types, physical and spiritual. Physical immortality is the unending existence of the mind from a physical source such as a brain or computer. Spiritual immortality is unending existence of a person after physical death such as having a soul. Subsection Physical Immortality Technological immortality is the name given to the prospect for much longer lifespans made possible by scientific advances in a variety of fields. Nanotechnology, emergency room procedures, genetics, human physiology, engineering, regenerative medicine, microbiology, and others. Contemporary lifespans in the advanced industrial societies are already markedly longer than those of the past because of better nutrition, availability of health care, standard of living, and biomedical scientific advances. Technological immortality predicts further progress for the same reasons over the near term. An important aspect of current scientific thinking about immortality is that some combination of human cloning, cryonics, or nanotechnology will play an essential role in extreme life extension. Robert Friatas, a nanorobotics theorist, suggests we may be able to create tiny medical nanorobots that could go through our bloodstreams, find dangerous things like cancer cells and bacteria, and destroy them. Priatos anticipates that gene therapies and nanotechnology will eventually make the human body effectively self-sustainable and capable of living indefinitely. Short of severe trauma, of course, some suggest we'll be able to continually create biological or synthetic replacement parts to replace damaged or dying ones. Some people believe that such treatments will not be available in their natural lifespan. Cryonics is the practice of preserving organisms, either intact specimens or only their brains, for possible future revival by storing them at cryogenic temperatures where metabolism and decay are almost completely stopped. Ideally, this would allow clinically dead people to be brought back in the future after cures to the patient diseases have been discovered and aging is reversible. Modern cryonics procedures use a process called vitrification, which creates a glass-like state rather than freezing as the body is brought to low temperatures. This process reduces the risk of ice crystals damaging the brain structure. Many people who wish to become physically immortal think of cryonics as a backup plan in case the emerging life extension technologies don't develop rapidly enough. Some believe that biological forms have inherent limitations in their design, primarily their fragility and inability to immediately morph to fit the environment. A way around that predicament may someday present itself in the ability to exist outside the biological form. Over the long term, the biological nature of humanity may be only temporary. Should technology permit, people may circumvent death and evolution simply by taking artificial forms. One interesting possibility involves uploading the personality and memories via direct mind-computer interface. Some extropian futurists propose that, thanks to exponentially growing computing power, it will someday be possible to upload human consciousness onto a computer system and live indefinitely in a virtual environment. This could be accomplished via advanced cybernetics, where computer hardware would initially be installed in the brain to help sort memory or accelerate thought processes. 
Gradually, more and more components would be added until the person's entire brain functions were handled by artificial devices, without any sharp transitions that would lead to some identity issues mentioned below. At this point, the human body would become only an accessory, and the mind could be transferred to any sufficiently powerful computer. A person in this state would then be essentially immortal, short of cataclysmic destruction of the entire civilization and their computers. However, some argue that although the computer consciousness would be an exact copy of the original, and thus undetectable to others, the original mind would no longer exist. Quantum immortality is the name for the speculation that the Everett Many Worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics implies that a conscious being cannot cease to be. The idea is highly controversial. Theoretically, given any potentially fatal event that could happen to, say, a quantum physicist, there will be possible universes in which the physicist indeed dies, and other possible universes where the physicist somehow survives. As time goes on, the physicist is dead in more and more of all possible universes due to random accidents and aging. However, because there are infinite possibilities, there will always be at least one universe in which the physicist miraculously lives another day. The idea behind quantum immortality is that the physicist would only be able to experience the universe in which he survives, even though there may be an increasingly small subset of the possible universes. In this way, the physicist would appear, from his own standpoint, to be living forever. Some of the potential ultimate fates of the universe could present an eventual death with no means of avoidance, no matter how unlikely, but even then, in an infinite universe, there could be some means of working around such a limit. Long before modern science made such speculation feasible, people wishing to escape death sought what we might term mystical immortality, turning to the supernatural world for answers. Examples include the medieval alchemists and their search for the Philosopher's Stone, or more modern religious mystics such as Sri Aurobindo, who believed in the possibility of achieving physical immortality through spiritual transformation. Rastafarians believe in physical immortality as a part of their religious doctrines. They believe that after their God has called the Day of Judgment, they will go to what they describe as Mount Zion in Africa to live in freedom forever. Instead of having everlasting life, which implies an end to the world at last, the Rastas look forward to having everlasting life in itself. Another group that believe in physical immortality are the rebirthers, who believe that by following the connected breathing processes of rebirthing, they will live forever physically. Some people believe physical immortality would not be possible or even desirable. Jacques Cousteau, in the preface to his book, The Ocean World, expressed his meditations on physical immortality as a part of life and its adaptive processes. Death, Kishchow states, is a fundamental to evolution, and evolution is fundamental to survival. He concludes that, biologically speaking, immortality does not present a possible means to avoid death. Mortal or immortal, an organism must die. Michael Shermer believes there is no significant scientific evidence for the proposed methods of achieving physical immortality. He says about them, all have some basis in science, but none has achieved anything like scientific confirmation. In Hinduism, one feat that advanced yogis, practitioner of yoga, can supposedly perform is body jumping the ability to jump into another host and therefore live a longer life. Many Indian fables and tales include instances of this, and some believers treat the frequent recurrence of this idea as evidence that an immortality method cannot be dismissed outright. There are also entire Hindu sects devoted to the attainment of physical immortality by various methods, namely the Nas and the Agoras new section on spiritual immortality.
Spiritual immortality, on the other hand, is a belief that is expressed in nearly every religious tradition. In both Western and Eastern religions, the spirit is an energy or force that transcends the mortal shell and returns to either the heavens or the cycle of life, directly or indirectly, depending on tradition. Below, we consider the perspective of some of the world's most popular religions on spiritual immortality. Buddhists believe that there is a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, and that the process is according to the qualities of their actions. This constant process of becoming ceases at the fruition of enlightenment, bodhi, at which a being is no longer subject to causation, karma, but enters into a state that the Buddha called amata, deathlessness. However, in Buddhism there is no belief in an eternal soul, anatta, and some sects also believe in rather a collection of habits and memories in a dynamic process of constant change. At enlightenment, the karmic seeds for all future becoming and rebirth are exhausted. After biological death, a Narat or Buddha enters into what is called Parinibbana. Christians believe that every person will be resurrected. Some believe the resurrection will be bodily, a renewed physical body. Some spiritually, a change spiritual, as it were, body. After judgment, those saved will live forever in the presence of God, and the lost will be abandoned to never any consciousness of guilt, separation from God, and punishment for sin. Eternal damnation is depicted in the Bible as a realm of constant physical and spiritual anguish in a lake of fire, and a realm of darkness away from God. Some suggest the fires of hell are a theological metaphor standing for the inescapable presence of God endured the absence of God for love. Others suggest that hell represents complete destruction of both the physical body and of spiritual existence, or annihilation. Catholic theology also teaches that there is a realm called purgatory, where souls who have accepted Jesus are purged of their sins before they are, before they are admitted into heaven. Some Christian sects also believe in a third realm called Limbo, Latin border, which is the final destination of souls who have not been baptized, but who have been innocent of mortal sin. Souls in Limbo include unbaptized infants and those who live virtuously, but were never exposed to Christianity in their lifetime. Hinduism believes an immortal soul which is reincarnated after death. According to Hindu Hinduism, people repeat a cycle of life, death, and rebirth, a cycle called samsara. If they live their life well, their karma increases and their station in the next life will be higher and conversely lower if they live their life poorly. Eventually, after many lifetimes of perfecting one's karma, the soul is freed from the cycle and lives in perpetual bliss. There is no never-ending hell in Hinduism, although if a soul consistently lives very evil lives, they could work their way down to the very bottom of the cycle. Islam believes that everyone has an immortal soul that will live on in either paradise or hell, depending on how one lives their life. Like Christianity and Judaism, there are no second chances following death in Islam. On Judgment Day, one's place of existence for all eternity is decided. Judaism claims that the righteous dead will be resurrected in the Messianic Age with the coming of the Messiah. They will then be granted immortality in a perfect world. The wicked dead, on the other hand, will not be resurrected at all. This is in contrast to Christianity, where the wicked dead are still immortal and exist forever, albeit in hell. This is not the only Jewish belief about the afterlife. Others do believe in some version of hell. The Torah is not specific about the afterlife, so there are wide differences in views and explanations among believers. Shinto claims that, except for those who choose or are dispatched to the underground world of Yami, every living and non-living beings may lose their body, but not their tamashi, soul. 
and they live together with immortal souls as an immortal being called Kami. Unlike the previously mentioned religions, Shinto allows anything to attain Kami status regardless of its existence before becoming Kami. Therefore, even those that do not believe in Shinto may choose to become Kami, as well as things like a rock, a tree, or even a robot. Some may be reincarnated for various reasons. Shinto has no version of Hell or a Judgment Day. We now move to the section titled Concepts of Immortality. Considerations of immortality usually bring to mind the idea of unending existence a freedom from the concerns of annihilation and death. Often, talk of the immortality of the soul arises in conjunction with talk of immortality. The idea of science and religion find common goals in the perpetuity of man's existence. As a thought experiment, suppose that clinical immortality were possible, in which, through advanced life support machinery or similar, the bodily functions of a comatose human could be kept running in perpetuity. Is it good news to keep a vegetative human's heart pumping for eons? According to the vast majority of ethicists, not at all, since unending biological functioning is not what is at issue in immortality. Ultimately, what one desires is some sort of permanent preservation of personal identity not just unceasing metabolic integrity. This brings up the philosophical issue of the meaning of consciousness. As another thought experiment, suppose a surgeon replaces part of a man's brain with a pacemaker. This is actually done to treat Parkinson's. After this procedure is done, the patient comes out of his an anesthesia feeling like the same person. For the intentions of this experiment, Suppose that doctors already fully understand the brain and are able to successfully move sections of the brain's neural network and memories onto hardware where they can perfectly emulate the architecture of the brain. Over a period of time, suppose that the individual has many more operations with the intent of gradually replacing parts of his brain with computer hardware. Eventually, the man has a brain made entirely out of computer parts. The man comes out claiming he is the same person as before. He has the same memories and acts the same. Now suppose that instead of replacing parts of his brain with hardware, he copies the entire brain onto hardware. The computerized version of this man's brain acts the same way and claims that it is the same man who underwent the procedure. The original man is still alive, however. Are the machine and the, brain and the man the same person? Are they somehow linked in consciousness? These are the types of situations that illustrate the lack of knowledge concerning the meaning of consciousness that we as a civilization currently possess. Essential to many of the world's religions is the doctrine of eternal afterlife. But well-known narratives in Christianity and Islam, for example, show why freedom from annihilation and death could, in principle, not be desirable. Consider a quote from the King James Bible from the book of Luke. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Adam afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Or take another quote from the Quran, chapter 11. Those who are wretched shall be in the fire. There will be for them therein nothing but the heaving of sighs and sobs. They will dwell therein for all the time that the heavens and the earth endure, except as thy Lord willeth. For thy Lord is the sure accomplisher of what he planneth. And those who are blessed shall be in the garden, they will dwell therein for all the time that the heavens and the earth endure, except as thy Lord willeth, a gift 
without break. Instances from other religions could be added, especially from Buddhism, which considers the eternal rebirth to human life an essentially undesirable condition to be overcome, though with a goal of attaining at a higher level, not the ceasing of existence. Mere perpetual existence, then, is obviously not enough. Ultimately, one desires that this existence be of a desirable quality. As the prevalence of suicide suggests, people would often prefer not to exist at all than exist in a severely unpleasant environment. In Tolkien's Middle-earth mythos, the immortal elves were said to view the mortality of men to be a gift. This was chiefly due to the elves' clear faculty of memory, which accumulated thousands of years of sad memory. Immortality of just one person would eventually grow to torture, as everyone you care about will die around you. However, author Georges Borg explores the consequences of a whole society becoming immortal in the book The Immortal. There, having achieved immortality, there is no motivation for any action, for time becomes infinite. For the immortals, time is unimportant. Borg's here is highlighting the idea that life gets meaning from death. When a person is tired of life, even death is shut off to them, creating an endless torture, as evidenced in the Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day. When talk of a soul arises, immediately concerns of psychology and metaphysics become relevant. Suppose, as yet another thought experiment. An engineer produces a wondrous new nanotechnology machine. At two key moments during life, he might eagerly announce a human would step into this device. At the first trip into the device, a full molecular scan of all 7 times 10 to the 27th atoms in the body is recorded. At the second trip into the device, ideally many years later, the molecular structure is instantly disseminated. Furthermore, during this second trip, a reference is taken of the earlier scan, and an appropriate amount of organic goo is added or subtracted to precisely match the configuration of materials original to the 7 times 10 to the 27 atoms as configured at the first scan. As an application, Jones at 30 walks in, Jones at 30 walks out. Years later, Jones at 80 walks in, Jones, allegedly, at 30 walks out. Has the engineer done Jones a favor? According to most ethicists, the engineer has not done Jones a favor, even if Jones could, as it were, wash, rinse, and repeat this whole cycle indefinitely. First off, it's anything but clear that the human exiting the machine at the second trip is indeed Jones. Call the person who steps out, whether he is Jones or not, Jones Star. Presuming that memory is a physiological structure encoded by neural pathways, Jones Star would not preserve the memory of Jones, since Jones Star would not have the encoded neural pathways of an 80-year-old, but only of a 30-year-old. Hence, all that Jones was, after 30 anyway, as a collection of memory experiences upon second entry into the vice is lost, thus Jones is effectively dead. Immortality would offer little if the best results obtainable were a recurring coda of temporal duplicates. Second, even if the eager engineer were to modify his machine due to popular demand, so as to configure all the neural pathways of Jones star to match Jones, this would still present problems. Jones does not want a perfect duplicate to exit the machine at the second trip, but Jones himself wants to exit the machine. Granted, if all were done discreetly, Jones' wife, Jones' mistress, and Jones' poker buddies would think that Jones' star was Jones, and even Jones' star himself might think he was Jones. But thinking that X is true is hardly a guarantee that X really is true. Third, the Jones slash Jones' star problem is at issue in religious accounts of resurrection. Since humans share substantial quanta of their atoms with others who have preceded them in history, that is, coffins leak eventually and nature cycles the organic material back to the biosphere, 
any resurrection cannot use all the original atomic collection for each individual to be resurrected. New material would be required. Thus, worries about a duplicate thinking that she or he was the original person arises for the pious as well as for the atheist. The theological answer to this question is that either A, it doesn't matter if all your exact biomatter is exactly the same at the time of resurrection as when you died, so long as your soul is inside. Or B, if God is going to use divine power to resurrect a slew of people, he can use divine power to redivide up the biomatter as well, if indeed that is important. Apparently, on any account where immortality requires a remanufacture of a body in order to maintain character identity, seemingly insurmountable difficulties present themselves, especially due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Some views of quantum immortality approach the general issue of immortality differently. Further sections follow on symbols of immortality and immortality in fiction.